All right. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Miguel de Casa, and uh, I've been working. I've been working on open source for for many years. Um, I first started contributing to uh, the Linux and the GNU project in 1992, and uh, I, I tried. I built a company to build the open source software, and and we tried. And it was very rough. It was very difficult to to keep your friends employed with open source. So we built a proprietary company, uh, which led to a little bit of a disagreement with Richard Stallman. So he kicked me out of the foundation. And, uh, and then I went to build another company, which this time around I didn't try to do open source. Um, and, uh, and it was, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun in that company. We specialized on mobile, on Android, and iOS development, Linux, Mono, uh, at an era where uh, Microsoft was not very well welcomed in the open source world. Uh, and then two things happened. Uh, they changed the CEO. Uh, we went from Steve Palmer, which was a, uh, a sales guy, very aggressive, very not very open to ideas about open source. And we went to Sachin Adela, who is a completely different person, uh, uh, a man that likes to read a lot of books and have his uh, opinions challenged. and. Uh, he decided to embrace open source and he decided to embrace uh, uh, free software. So uh, I was running this company with my friend Nat Friedman and uh, Microsoft acquired us in 2016. And the first thing that Microsoft did is they turned our proprietary, very expensive proprietary products into open source products. Uh, so, it, I mean, to give an idea, each, a license per seed was $2,000 and we were selling them like hot pancakes um, and, uh, or hot... Uh, Waffles, as you would say here. <laughs> and, uh, and the first thing that Satya and Scott got through did is like, no, 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 we're going to open source all this stuff. This is now public work. So, uh, so, he, he, uh, so ironically, it was Satya and Adele and Scott Guthrie that brought me back to the open source world after all these years. Anyways, uh, since, uh, since I've been working in 1992 on Linux or Mac OS, I've always used this... Uh, uh, I've always used, I, I probably have one running here right now. Let me see if I have one. Oh, the machine just rebooted, so you won't see it. Uh, but this is my file manager. It's a file manager that I started writing in 1992. It's called the Midnight Commander. Uh, it's still branded GNU Midnight Commander from when Richard liked me. And, uh, and uh, I spend my life in this thing. Usually I have dozens of instances of the, this file manager, uh, despite the fact that I that I started the Grand Project, that I use a Mac every day. Uh, I still spend most of my days in the Linux shell. This is my life. This is where I spend my life. Uh, this is where I do all my file operations, how I keep my life organized. Uh, and it's uh, done wonders. It is a clone of a DOS app. So this was a clone of a DOS app that I missed when Linux came on the market. And I said, I got to have this. I understand the Linux philosophy, but give me my shell. So I went and built this thing. Uh, so this is my life, and what I want to tell you, talk to you about today is uh, really a pet project of mine that has nothing to do with my commercial offerings or anything that I've done in the past. This is just my evening hack. It's the thing that I do on the afternoons. And I'm doing this talk because the person that was going to do this talk didn't show up. Um, so they were going to do a very similar uh, talk about building user interface applications with .NET. It was going to be a competing framework, and because I was the chair of the session, I figured it would be unfair to compete with him. So I said, let's do this talk, but then he withdrew. So it's, uh, I think it's fair. Um, so this is uh, my talk with text user interfaces. This is the first machine that I started working on at the university uh, with my dad. It was a DEC uh, VT100. Uh, that was a keyboard with a detachable keyboard. It does the most beautiful scrolling you've ever seen. Now, most of you don't know, well, I bet you none of you have seen one of those uh, or used one of those, so you don't appreciate what this beautiful smooth scrolling is. But today, uh, the same technology that powers that thing, an evolution of this set of escape sequences and the way you communicate with the terminal is what is used on, on consoles, on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and I'm still very much in love with that, and I still use this tool every day. So I decided to build a UI toolkit that would let me build applications uh, 
for the console. And it is relatively painful. I'm, I'm shortening this talk. It's a much longer talk. But it's very painful to build this desktop application, these console applications on Linux because uh, you need to learn a lot about curses, about input, about Xterm consoles, uh, the Windows console. If you want to build something that works across the board, it's relatively annoying to do and get it right. And there's complications in terms of colors and mouse support. Um, so uh, one day I decided that uh, I had it and I wanted to build something for me. So this is a project that I built just for me. Now, this UI that you see this there is implemented with this code, with this C-sharp code. Um, and uh, it leverages some of the idioms that are common in C-sharp, like, for example, this nested creation of objects, uh, this lambda functions that attached an action to a menu. For example, when you press a quit menu, it invokes this function, right? So this is a full if statement there. Um, and, uh, and that's the UI that you get for that. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a, bit, a little bit about how this works. So what you need to, know, what you need to remember um, is that uh, for the past almost ten, 10 years, oh my god, almost 10 years, for the past 10 years, I've been working mostly on bringing .NET to Android and iOS. So my view of what a UI toolkit should be has been influenced by iOS and Android extensively. And uh, you don't know this. You don't know this. Um, we're going to get this fixed eventually. Um, you don't know this, but one of the original uh, window managers by, that's by used by the GNOME desktop when we launched, who here is old enough? Who was born before 1990? All right, so, okay. So when we launched this thing, we launched this in 1999. Okay, who was 15 in 1999? At least oh, a couple, all right. So when we launched GNOME, you know, we launched with this window manager. It was a, a fabulous window manager, super configurable. It was written in a variation of Lisp. It was called Sawfish. <laughs> and this window manager was built by none other than uh, uh, that, I forget, uh, uh, Harup, and he went to build the core animation framework that powers every iPhone. So every time that you see a buttery smooth UI on the iPhone, that guy came from GNOME, right? But he went to Apple, and uh, he landed all of those ideas. So all the animation frameworks and all the smoothness on Apple came from this guy from the GNOME universe. Anyways, so when I was building this <laughs> retro user interface, I was influenced by the, mostly by the U iOS UI design. Uh, system and how it works. So, uh, so I wanted to blend some of the things that you wanted to do on a, on a text user interface and some of the ideas that come from uh, from iOS. So first of all, let's start with what every um, uh, what every modern UI application framework has. This time, transported to the console to a raw console is we do have a main team, uh, a, a, a main loop, and what that does is it handles your input. Uh, that can be keyboard, it can be the mouse, it can be file descriptors, it handles timers, it handles idle events. So there's a whole infrastructure that you've come to expect from things like Qt or GTK or, or WPF or, or iOS. This is, uh, I, I don't know, I, clearly it's proprietary software that is failing me. Um, <laughs> is there some sort of, uh... all right. Um, and it has a whole system of redrawing damages, uh, damage uh, uh, regions of the screen. Um, and this is all handled by the application.run. The second piece that is interesting is that I copy the design from iOS for views. And this, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful things that iOS has, which is anything that goes into the screen is called a view. And there are certain attributes as to whether they can take input or not input. But views themselves are not leaves. Any view can contain further views inside. So, you can use them as your, either as a leaf or as a building block. And everything is built on top of a view. Um, the, uh, and this is roughly how you compose them, right? So you just nest these things. You nest these things and you need to have a, a system that handles the focus and handles how the focus is going to work uh, when you tap it and how you write the events. So a lot of what this library does is handling those for you. And it lets you, like I said, build these nested user interfaces the same way that iOS does. So what I'm saying is this is the iOS of terminal applications. Um, now, there are three fundamental types. These are very simple, but we'll come to this in a second because this is the one area where I think that I am much better than all the garbage that Apple did with iOS. Um, 
which is a rectangle points and sizes. And, and I say that it's garbage because I, uh, they built a layout system that requires a PhD. Uh, the other day, somebody on Twitter said, oh, you're a great programmer. I wish I was with you, like you. And I said, you have not seen me struggle for the last three weeks trying to get a layout on the screen with auto layout. It is so embarrassing that I have not published the Git repo. I've kept it secret because I can't get this thing to work. So it's probably going to take me another week, and then I'll publish it. But it's been a world of misery. So, um, so this is the layout system for people like me, people in their 40s, that they can't really do these things anymore. Life is too short. So we have two sets of layout positioning. The first one is you say, I want you to be from 0, 0 to 10, 10. That's what it is. No questions asked. And off you go. And the second one is this mark positioning, which where the x and y properties are not actually x, uh, they're, they're not integers. They belong to this type called pause. And the width and height are defined in terms of this type called dimension. And it just happens, too, that we've created an implicit conversion from integers to those. So you can always say x equals 10, and it will fix it, right? So, uh, so for, for those of you, uh, you know, for those of you of my age, you can just get it done that way or people in the enterprise. But this is the magic, and pay attention. This is really the magic. There are a couple of operations here. You can create these pause objects with a number of, of things, like, for example, pause with the percent method. These are all static methods. God damn it. Um, these are all static methods. So you can say, I want a percentage. So you say pause.percent 10, and it will give you a position that will be 10% of the container, right? Anchor n means I want this position to be attached to the end of my container with this much buffer space, the margin there, which is a default option. I want this to be centered. And this is centered compared to my container. Right? Remember, every view is nested. So this is always uh, compared to the previous one. Uh, this is the implicit operation that I mentioned. You can also operate on this thing. So you can, you, you can take a position. It's 10% plus 10 units plus uh, center. So you can say center plus 10% plus 5 units, for example. So you can add this up, and you can subtract those up. Uh, you can also use this anchor point, so you can say the positions to the left, to the right, and then add offsets to them uh, if you want to. Or you can have positions that are relative to other views. So you can say this is a position that needs to be anchored to this other view. So I don't know where you're putting the other view on the screen. Just make me relative to that, either to the left, to the right, center, whatever. Right. So, um, And the same thing goes for dimensions. It doesn't have as many operations, but again, you can describe operations in terms of, I want you to fill up all the available space, right? Or be a percentage of the space. And the same thing, this two important one is it. Uh, and again, uh, you get these combination operators. And I think it's probably one of the best ideas that I've had in many, many years. Um, and this is what it looks like. So a UI doing a login password and a couple of other things, you can say that you can see that at first I started to I, I said I want to center this piece in the in the X dimension on the screen, right? And the Y I fixed it. Now notice what I do with the next one. I say, well, I want the left position to be the left one of the parent one. So now I don't need to worry where it goes. What is interesting is that it is the login that gets centered, right? It is the login that gets centered, and it, whatever that ends up. And the password is just going to be below. So it's not going to be center. It's not going to be on the side. It's going to be attached below. Right? And you can see a couple more examples. The Y basically says, I want you to be one line below. So attach to the bottom. Add one line. Jesus. I'm very sorry about this. I don't know what's going on. Maybe there's some timer, auto timer going on. Uh, what? All right. Well, I hope you enjoy this. Um, <laughs> Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, but you get the idea. There's a couple of things that are worth keeping in mind, which is that uh, because VT100s that are still in use, usually when you SSH or you have a poor terminal, they do not have a lot of colors. In terminals that have a lot of colors, you really shouldn't be thinking about colors. You really need to be thinking about attributes. So to make things simple, I've introduced an attribute system that can define these things. Um, and, uh, and I'll give you an example. This is a, a regular UI. And you don't really think about setting the colors for these ones. Instead, you need to think about which colors you're going to use for normal text, for the hot key, for the normal text, the focus key, and the hot focus key. Right? So these are things that you need to do that typically in a, in a GUI UI you no longer have to do. Um, 
Do not worry, we do have, uh, we do have color schemes already built for you, so you don't have to think about this thing, you just pick a style. Now, I would like one day to bring some sort of CSS-like system so that it's easier to customize. Right now you have to, kind of like an animal, say, this is the black and white settings, and these are the full color settings, and this is the 256 color settings. But uh, anyways, uh, there's a ton of views that you can use today. Um, so, and they're super easy to, to build, uh, so uh, feel free to use it or not. And uh, you know, uh, we have convenient things for creating dialogues, pop-up boxes, message boxes. Uh, you know, your file save dialogues, etc. So, anyways, this is my new toy. Uh, this is my new toy. And the last thing that I want to finish with is, uh, you know, this is just a warning for those of you doing multi-thread applications. But uh, when we build mobile app uh, frameworks, we build this cross-platform UI toolkit called Xamarin Forms, which is you build it once and it runs on Android, iOS, Mac, WPF, etc. Right? And uh, this guy, god damn it, uh, Javier. Javier from, uh, from Spain went and ported our UI toolkit to the console. So this, this is, again, the XAML that you were seeing a minute ago in the talk about F Sharp or the WebAssembly talk. You can use that and generate uh, uh, console applications from that. So thank you very much, folks.